Hi, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, tonight, I want to talk about a couple of things. But before I do, I want to remind you that if you're in Montreal this Sunday, we're going to be hosting a wonderful fundraiser for Zaka. When I was in Israel, I saw firsthand the incredible work that they do. And we're going to be hosting some world-renowned comics, Ami Kozak, Ashley Blaker from BBC, some local comics, Chol Face, Levy Goldstein. And so I will uh, put some notes here so that you can get tickets, as well as I have a number of really great Shabbatones coming up. I'm going to be in New Jersey uh, in, in about two weeks uh, for Modern Orthodox Singles. And I'm going to be doing a few events with Elisa Ben Shalom. And you can go to theloverabbi.com and you can find out about those. Right now, let's have a conversation. One of the things I've been wondering over the past few months since October 7th is about Jerusalem and the Quran. Why, why is Jerusalem considered a holy city to Muslims if Jerusalem doesn't even appear in the Quran at all? So I did a little research and I find out that the story goes that a hundred years after the death of Muhammad, the Umayyad dynasty ruled Jerusalem. And the Umayyads were locked in a fierce power struggle with a renegade governor in Mecca. And the official holy place for Islam is Mecca. And since the Umayyads didn't want their citizens making pilgrimages to Mecca, they decided to turn Jerusalem into a new Muslim holy city. They actually organized a, a convention of Muslim scholars, and they worked hard to create references to Jerusalem in the Muslim liturgy. The Quran actually describes Muhammad's nighttime journey, the one in which he supposedly rose to heaven in a chariot, as follows. It says that Allah took his servants at night from the holy mosque to the farther mosque. And the farther mosque in Arabic is called remember correctly, I think it's called Al-Masid Al-Asqa, or something like that. And so the Umayyads went and they built a beautiful mosque on the Temple Mount, and they named it the Farther Mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's the origin of that name. And so what they did there is they accomplished two things. Number one is they successfully insert Jerusalem into the Quran after the writing of the Quran. And they're also inserting a new chapter in Muhammad's life, inventing the place from which he supposedly rose up to heaven. Now, the concept of a prophet rising up to heaven alive in the flesh is actually drawn from Judaism. In Judaism, we have a prophet named Elijah. Elijah the prophet He's the one who comes and visits all the satyrs on the night of Passover. We prepare a special cup for Elijah. At every Brit, at every circumcision, we prepare a special chair. It's called the chair of Elijah. On Saturday night after Shabbat, we often will sing after the Havdalah ceremony, the song of Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Anavi. In the book of Kings, in chapter 2, we're told about the passing of Elijah the prophet, of Eliyahu Anavi. Eliyahu was walking with his student, Elisha. Actually, Elisha will become his successor. And Eliyahu, Elijah suddenly turned to Elisha and said to him, uh, wait for me here. I need to go somewhere. But Elisha, being a devoted student, wouldn't agree. And he swore that he wouldn't leave Elijah's side. And so they continued walking together. And finally, Elijah turns to Elisha and says, ask what shall I do for you before I'm taken from you? Essentially, what Elijah is saying is, is make your last request before I'm taken from this world. So Elisha asks, please let there be double of your spirit upon me. In other words, I want to be twice as great a prophet as you are. Now, to such a request, Elijah replies, you asked with difficulty, meaning you asked for too much. Obviously, you asked for too much. You want to be double as great as your teacher? 
However, and fascinatingly enough, Elijah gave Elisha a sign that would tell him whether his request would be fulfilled or not. He says, if you see me being taken from you, it shall be unto you so. And if not, it shall not be. Which means if he witnesses Elijah passing away, it would be a sign that God had granted him twice as much prophecy. And if not, it would be a sign that his request had not been fulfilled. So the story continues that they continued walking together and talking together. And suddenly a wall of flame appeared and separated the two of them. And the verse then says, and Elijah rode up, rose up in a storm wind to heaven. Elijah disappeared. He didn't die like everyone else. His body simply disappeared. Only his coat remained. I know you can picture the movie kind of playing out in your head right now, right? The flume of smoke, the wind, Elijah disappears, and all you see is the coat fall to the floor. Elijah simply disappeared alive. And I think this is where the Muslims get this story. Now, it may seem that this is the pinnacle of spiritual achievements for any human being to achieve. To go up to heaven in his very body, I mean, what could possibly be holier than that? We see, actually, that Moses, for example, who was the greatest Jew who ever lived, did not go to heaven like that. Rather, he dies like all people. His soul rose to heaven and his body was buried at Mount Navo. Now, if there's anyone who deserved to rise to heaven alive, it would be Moses, correct? The master of all prophets and a much greater prophet than Elijah and all the other prophets. So why didn't he go to heaven alive? There's actually another story, an interesting story, that's told about the Baal Shem Tov, by Israel Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, that he had been given the choice to be like Elijah and to go up to heaven alive in a storm wind. But he explained that he didn't want to lose the opportunity to fulfill the verse, dust you are and to dust you shall return. Why? It seems so more magical to do it the Elijah way. What's behind the Baal Shem Tov's words? I think to understand this, and I'm sure you're thinking like, wow, this is really out there and very esoteric. Maybe. But let's take a step back and let's look at this week's Torah portion. This week's portion of Teruma deals with the construction of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. All the commentators ask, why were the Jews required to build a house for God? The great commentator, the Abarbanel, he says, why did God order the making of the Mishkan, of a tabernacle, as if he were a defined body limited by space, which is a, the opposite of the truth? In other words, God is above time and space. We, human beings, are limited to time and space. We are limited and defined by this world. So often, we have a difficulty understanding things that are beyond this world because we're so limited by this world. God, on the other hand, is the opposite. God is not limited, though I'm not going to get <laughs> existential here, but in order to be unlimited, you have to also be limited. Different conversation for a different time. But God is above time and space, not limited by anything. And we little humans are going to build a house? Come on. What are we talking about? Is this child's play here? You're going to build a house for God, and in that house, you're going to say, oh, this is where God's going to rest. God is beyond houses and resting. So what was the goal? When I look into this week's Torah portion, it's a question I ask myself every time. What was the goal of the house building project for God? Why do we have to build a home for God in this world? This whole portion talking about cubits and, and, and wood and gold and copper and all these things that we needed to physically build a home for God. For what? 
On the surface, it rings false to anyone who believes that God is not limited in any way. It doesn't make any sense. So the Abarbanel provides an amazing answer to his own question. He says God's intention in the making of the tabernacle and the making of its vessels was that no one think that God created the world and abandoned it. That God created the world and then said, oh, my throne is in the heaven and I'll be distant from you. I'll be distant from mankind. To remove this false belief from the hearts of the people, he ordered that they make him a home as if he lived among them. And so that they would believe that God lives within them. Let me explain it this way. The entire goal of the tabernacle, the entire goal of the Mishkan was to create the feeling that God is here on this earth, right here amongst us. This is fascinating. I'll tell you why. In other religions, the ultimate goal is to get to heaven. Why? Because that's where God is found, in heaven. In Judaism, it's the exact opposite. The entire goal is not to transport yourself up there to God, but to transport God down here to you, to this physical world. And that's why when Moses passed away, his body remains down here. I'll give you another example of this concept. At Mount Sinai, at the first encounter between God and the Jewish people, the Torah says, God descended upon Mount Sinai. And ever since then, it has been our mission to draw down the divine presence, the, the, the divine presence, the Shekhinah, down here on earth. That has been our goal. That has been what we've wanted since that moment, to bring heaven down to earth, to bring the divine presence into this world. Now, picture yourself. Someone's throwing a huge party. They spend a lot of money. And as you can understand, that person who's spending all the money and throwing the party is called the party's host. But suddenly, a bunch of people who don't know how to host show up at the party. They start eating, drinking, partying, and they ignore the host. They actually act like it's their party. They ask one person from their group, say a few words. Tell us about what's going on. And the other one said, hey, why don't you make a toast? They literally go on as if the host is not there. If you were the host of this party, what would you feel? How would you take these random people just showing up at your house? I believe that None of us would let something like that happen in our party. I think you get the metaphor. It happens in our world every single day. God created the universe and organized a massive festival. Millions of people came. They ate, they had lost to drink, and they ignored the host. Worst of all, they acted as if they were the hosts as if they had organized the party. From this, I think we have a very important lesson in this week's Torah portion. And maybe a lesson that we can take to heart. Our mission in this world is to make sure that we don't forget who the host of the party is. It's interesting because that's why the Rebbe started the 10 mitzvah campaigns mitzvahs that were practical to remind us that this house has an owner and that's why we put a mezuzah on our door. To remind us that God rested on the seventh day and so we light Shabbat candles. We give tzedakah because God is benevolent and it's a mitzvah. These are all mitzvahs. Mitzvah means tzavta connection.
These are ways that we can connect with the host. These are ways that we can connect with God. Practical mitzvahs that we can do on a regular basis. The entire mission is to remind us that every moment we should remember who the host of this whole giant party is. And then we're always invited to the party. That's how we ensure it. So today, we are still reveling at, at the Super Bowl. One of my favorite moments was you thought that people were, 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 were rallying for either the Chiefs or the 49ers. That's not what was happening. In the middle of the Super Bowl, there was news that came out that two of the hostages in Israel were rescued. And there was such an excitement, you would have thought that somebody won the Super Bowl. That's the joy. We're reveling that two hostages were rescued. Those hostages, it's such an amazing moment to see that today we are united. We're united right now because for a moment, and I hope this moment doesn't just last a moment, it lasts for longer, that we know who the host of the party is. So many Jews are putting up mezuzahs on their doors. Yeah, it's true there's conversation about the rise in anti-Semitism. And there's a lot of rise in pro-Semitism too. People are putting mezuzahs on their door because that is a way to remind us that this house has an owner, that this world has a creator, and that we have the opportunity every single day, especially today, to be able to connect to that owner, to that builder. And so just as we talk about the house that we build for God, today it's our job to make our home to make this world a home for God. I wish all of you a wonderful week. And until we speak again, please continue reaching out. Send me your emails, your comments. I try to get to all of them. And uh, we'll continue discussing. Have a great day.